Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Gabriel Orsi, Project Manager with the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. I'm pleased to welcome you to Grief, Loss, and Bereavement, Coming to Terms with COVID-Related Losses, presented by Dr. Kira Masseff. I'd just like to start with a few words about our center and the network that we are part of. The Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center provides training and technical assistance to behavioral health and primary care providers and school and social service staff whose work has the potential to improve behavioral health outcomes for individuals with or at risk of developing serious mental illness in SAMHSA's Region 10, which is Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington State. We focus on evidence-based practices for serious mental health issues such as psychosis, but we do provide free training and technical assistance on a variety of topics, including integrated care, suicide prevention, diversity and equity issues, school mental health, peer support, and much, much more. We fulfill our mission through live events like this one, uh, through free online courses, virtual learning communities, our newsletter, our resource library on our website, and much, much more. So please take a moment and connect with us through um, our website, our social media presence, or our newsletter. I'd also like to take a moment at the start of our session today to do a land acknowledgement. We're based in Seattle, Washington, and our center sits on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. And we would like to acknowledge and honor the history and tradition of these communities in our region. It's our intention to always be mindful of using language that promotes recovery and is culturally appropriate. We encourage everyone to use language that demonstrates respect for a person's dignity and worth and is consistent with recovery oriented practices and fosters respect, dignity and hope. Also, we are recording today's session. So please keep in mind um, uh, any confidentiality issues that might arise because we are recording this for distribution. I won't bore you with reading this whole disclaimer from SAMHSA, but suffice to say that SAMHSA funds our center, but isn't taking a position, an official position on the content today. And now we're almost to the, the start of uh, our core presentation, and it's time to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kira Massa. She's a practicing clinical psychologist um, here in Washington State. She teaches as a senior instructor at Seattle University, and she's a co-lead for the Behavioral Health Strike Team for the Washington State Department of Health. Her work and research interests focus on resilience, trauma, and disaster behavioral health. She's worked extensively in Haiti with earthquake survivors, in Jordan with Syrian refugees, um, and with first responders and healthcare workers throughout the Puget Sound area and the US. She also conducts trainings such as this one with organizations and groups about disaster preparedness and resilience building within local communities. I'm very pleased to welcome back uh, for this installment in our series of modules with, with her, Dr. Kira Masseth. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're, <laughs> where you're joining us from. I think there's some folks from, from all over, and I'm really um, I'm happy to see everybody here today. I appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, but before I jump into the content, I just want to say that um, you know, nothing that I am talking about today is designed to give you more work to do. This is about um, learning things in context and, and putting, keeping in mind some of the behavioral health issues associated with the grief and loss that we've all experienced to some degree in the pandemic. Um, and the context can give you information to help support the work that you do, to help support you, but hopefully individually as well. Um, and I really strongly encourage you to ask questions. So if there are things that I'm covering throughout today that you would like a little bit more detail about or some additional clarification on, please don't hesitate to ask. I really, um, I really wanna encourage that. We are gonna do breakout rooms later on so that you can share ideas with each other. And I'm hoping that um, as providers or um, you know, on, a, on a personal or on a professional level that you're able to share tips for things that have worked um, and make some suggestions to all of us as colleagues here today. So that's the, that's the little intro. Um, for the, the plan is to cover you know, the, the nuanced um, multitude of ways that grief and loss and bereavement have affected all of us 
um, and, and certainly some individuals and communities and families more than others in the context of this pandemic. I'm gonna discuss the collective experience of loss, um, either primarily related to COVID or secondarily with all the ways that that comes together. And then give you some ideas about how to work with it, um, depending on what your job roles are. If you, if you would wanna share in the chat, um, you know, what type, of, uh, what type of work that you do or how you might apply this kind of information in your professional life, that would be helpful uh, just to, for us to share with each other, but you don't, don't feel obligated for sure. Um, and then I'm gonna share with you something called the HEAL model, which is an acronym that I developed to summarize some of the important takeaways about uh, dealing with grief and loss from a clinical psychology perspective. So the first thing is sort of this context around you know, how significantly this disaster has affected all of us and why there is so much um, grief, loss and bereavement that is unfolding in all, all variety of very, very complicated ways right now. Um, it is not just the direct loss of losing people. It is the, the deep uh, well of loss that sort of is connecting all of us in terms of the educational opportunities, the collegial sort of the water cooler chit chat with our, with our friends and colleagues. It's the social relationships with people that maybe we didn't know very well, but we haven't seen now in well over a year. Um, in addition to the very, very significant primary losses that a lot of folks have experienced because in some cases, um, in rather horrific conditions, they haven't been able to say goodbye to someone who was in the hospital or that they have lost um, because of the pandemic itself. And having people, um, you know, having healthcare workers sort of help families navigate through that process when they can't be with their loved ones. Um, that has been an, a very, very unique and a particularly sort of horrible challenge in this context as well. So the way that this all comes together is nuanced. There's lots of levels to it. There's lots of ways that people have experienced loss. And um, I wanna make sure to emphasize that it's part of our job to not pathologize what is a very, very normal process. So there are all kinds of ways. And in fact, there are probably are as many or more ways that people express grief and loss as there are um, to go through that experience. And um, to, to, not, to be careful, I suppose, clinically not to pathologize whatever those experiences look like. A prolonged grief disorder is, um, is defined sort of from a, from a clinical perspective as a, as a pathological response, which occurs, which occurs along with other things. So it's not grief in the sense that we um, normally kind of would experience it. It would be paired with or layered on top of um, major depressive disorder, something like generalized anxiety disorder or maybe panic disorder and PTSD. So it usually is comorbid with some of those other things. Um, and that's, that's sort of a, a package that we are seeing more commonly because there are more behavioral health concerns as we move through the pandemic, for sure. Um, the other, only other thing on this slide that I will mention is that the loss of a close relative in the context of COVID specifically is thought to, statistically at least, affect at least, not, affect at least nine other individuals with one loss. Um, so there is quite a... Um, a ripple effect from all of these experiences that we're sharing collectively. This is kind of what I was mentioning um, at the beginning about this collective experience of loss. I had a colleague tell me recently that any loss that we experience right now is not just that loss. It is touching on something that is much deeper for all of us on a very, very personal level because of the secondary losses that we've all had to some degree over the last year whether that's the loss of our space, whether that's the loss of our, our time, our relationships, our schedule, um, whether it's the loss of professional identity, um, whether it's the loss of purpose and motivation, right? All of our experience of loss is, is connected in some way internally to those other types of losses. So it is very, very common for our emotional reactions and responses to be proportionally stronger. So if something happens that you're not expecting and there is an experience of loss, maybe that you lose a pet um, or something like that, our proportional loss right now is likely to be much stronger in terms of our emotional, our limbic system reaction to that kind of thing as a result of this whole big, um, what is it now? 13, 14 months going on in some places for the pandemic. In motion regulation is already a really significant challenge right now. So the way that our limbic systems are functioning because they are so exhausted, most people are likely to respond a little bit more emotionally, a little bit more impulsively to things and to react very strongly to things right now. When you layer that under the conditions of loss, it really makes those effects a little bit more difficult. 
Um, it's difficult to manage professionally when we're working with clients and patients, and it's difficult to manage in our personal lives as well. This chart represents a graph that is meant to depict the typical pattern of response that people have to disasters in general from, from a behavioral health lens. It looks like the sinus rhythm for a heartbeat. And what ends up happening is that we go through what's called the impact phase. And again, this is for any disaster. This is based on data from uh, things like 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina and the tsunami in Southeast Asia, um, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, all variety of disasters. Humans respond in a very predictable way. And the pandemic is no exception to that. Um, the only exceptions are the, um, the deep sort of nuances for how the restrictions associated with the pandemic have been affecting our behavioral health. So impact phase was around, it was between January and March, depending on where you were in the world, right? And then we, of 2020. And then we go into what's called the heroic and the honeymoon phase. And that's when people are feeling a lot better. Um, unfortunately, the heroic and honeymoon phases are always followed by what's called the disillusionment phase. And that phase is when we really sort of come to terms with the loss. That's when we start to see the symptoms of bereavement. That's when we start to see grief um, being displayed in terms of behavior and symptoms in clinics and amongst family members. It takes about six to nine months um, from the impact of a disaster for those grief and loss experiences to really, really um, come, really, really come out and for people to really come to terms with what we have all lost collectively. So one of the unique issues about the pandemic as a disaster is that the disillusionment phase was extended. Um, in Washington, at least, um, the disillusionment phase was layered with all kinds of other things that just happened to be challenging at the same time. We had daylight savings, we had the weather got bad. Um, so hours of darkness, we had the federal election, we had um, another wave of a big spike of illness. We had uh, going into the holidays with restrictions where people couldn't spend the time with their families that they might've been at, um, attempting to try. So we had all of those things all at once in the disillusionment phase, which extended that whole thing. Where we are right now is in the transition out of disillusionment and into what we call reconstruction and recovery. So that, that, that transition is a great thing and it's part of any disaster recovery cycle for sure. But what's happening is that what we are finding in our communities and in our families um, is that the experiences of the, the reconstruction and the transition phase are very, very disparate depending on what your personal experiences have been. The dotted line on this chart represents something called a disaster cascade. And all that means is when a person or a family or a community has been impacted by more than one disaster within a 12 month period of time. So there's been more than one impact. It can, it can be at any point in the cycle, we just, we just added it in there. But the, 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 the big takeaway there is that when someone experiences a disaster cascade, it resets this entire process. It resets them on the disaster timeline and it, it starts them at a lower baseline. So the higher things are, the better people feel, the lower the, the, the line on the chart, the worse people are feeling in terms of symptoms. As we move forward into reconstruction and recovery, in the spring, it's more light, the weather is starting to get nice again, people are starting to feel better. There's more enthusiasm, there's a little bit more optimism, there's sort of a light at the end of the tunnel. But that is certainly not the case for everyone. And the behavioral health symptoms that people are experiencing are likely to be very different for people on that traditional typical pathway versus people who are on a disaster cascade pathway. And there are lots of variables that can determine what pathway, what pathway people are on, basically. Um, oh, sorry, I want to mention one more thing about that. Some of the other things that really have a direct relationship to grief and loss are some of the larger scale issues that people brought into the disaster. So adverse childhood experiences, previous experiences with disaster, and then directly as a result of the pandemic, racism or discrimination or additional social marginalization factors, as well as socio and economic factors that could set someone on the disaster cascade pathway. All of those things are potential losses. So food insecurity, the loss of a job, the loss of a home, um, just the uncertainty about economics. All of those things have the potential to contribute to this cascade. So everyone's experiences right now are going to vary even more dramatically than they already have. And we certainly know already that people were not having the same pandemic, right? Same storm, different boats. I don't know if that's something that you've heard, but our experiences thus far um, haven't been entirely uh, similar and they're, they're about to get more disparate from each other in terms of behavioral health. So one of the key things that's going on, 
um, and that, that really does inform the depth of the experience of grief and loss is how our brains have responded to dealing with this much stress and in certain cases trauma over a year long disaster experience. The limbic system is the part of the brain that's responsible for all the emotional processing, right? And it's exhausted. It has been, it has been activated for more than a year. It's been trying to keep us safe. And because it's responsible for emotion regulation and it's exhausted, people are not able to do that very effectively right now. So the human brain in general is likely to respond to neutral stimuli, anything like an email or a friend reaching out to say hello or um, a colleague at work checking in. Our brains are more likely to respond to neutral stimuli as being negative, threatening, or hostile and react accordingly. That, that whole um, process is exacerbated and sort of made worse by the, ex the deep experience of grief and loss. So we all are more, a little bit more sensitive, a little bit more likely to respond impulsively, and then our behavior tends to match that. So the limbic system is exhausted. It needs a break, it needs some opportunity to recover. And we're seeing more acuity in terms of the depth of experience that folks are having as a result. The other issue that's incredibly common right now, which is a struggle with processing bereavement and grief and loss, is that the prefrontal cortex, so the part of the brain that's responsible for organization and planning and details and tracking, that has been sort of offline for the last several months. Most adults feel like they have symptoms of either ADHD or early onset dementia. And that really is a big deal because it's scary for people. And when you're struggling with a loss and when you're going through a extreme emotional upheaval, you want your brain to sort of be working on your side to help you help you stay organized and just kind of survive and get through it. And the prefrontal cortex is not really participating. It's still there, of course, but it's not integrating and communicating effectively with the other parts of the brain. So that's a scary situation. Um, and the way that our, our neurology is responding to this thing makes the process of dealing with grief and loss that much more difficult. These are other common responses that people have at this phase of the disaster cycle as we transition from disillusionment into reconstruction and recovery. The way that these apply to the experience of grief and loss and bereavement um, are that they tend to, like I, like I just mentioned a second ago, they tend to exacerbate the emotional responses that people have. They tend to exacerbate the cognitive responses and they tend to manifest themselves physically. It's very, very common for people who have experienced grief and loss to have headaches and stomach aches and trouble sleeping. Those are also common responses for where we are in the disaster cycle. So there's a, there's a potential for things to double, to double up and layer up with each other. And for people to experience issues in any of these categories because they're dealing with both, both a sense of loss and a sense of stress that's caused by the baseline features of the disaster itself. Behaviorally, what is common to see when people are really in an extreme case of, of, of grief is acting out or acting in. Um, this is a normal thing. And acting out is when you express distress externally. So if you've gone through a significant loss, acting people who tend to act out are those who express that distress in an outward fashion. And that could be aggression or substance use or maybe even violent or illegal behavior on an extreme end. People on the other end of the spectrum might express their, their grief and their loss and their bereavement in an acting in way. And that's when you express distress internally and you shut down and you withdraw and you isolate even when you don't have to, even be not because of COVID restrictions, but just because you just can't connect with other people and you don't have any interest in doing that. The symptoms of acting in look a lot like symptoms of major depression as well. So there's a lot of overlap between them. Okay, so a few little ideas about working with grief, loss, and bereavement. Um, the first one to keep in mind, re regardless of the age group that you're working with, is that there's no specific time frame and there's no right or wrong way for people to process grief and loss. It is increasingly common right now because of COVID that people express anger. Anger is a very, very sort of culturally accepted emotion and anger often, often is the sort of, um, it's the more, I, what should I, how should I say this? It's the more socially accepted way to express sadness or fear. So we have a hard time talking about fear. We have a hard time talking about things that make us very sad. And we have a hard time processing through that. And oftentimes people will express anger um, as a way of sort of 
their brain's way of facilitating an easier expression of those deeper and more troubling emotional experiences. Anger is very um, easy to access neurologically and sadness and fear are a lot more difficult. So um, keeping in mind that you can see behavioral expressions of this in all kinds of different ways that you might not be expecting. In a professional context, if for those of you who are here um, looking for ideas about how to, how to really support people who have gone through grief and loss, Active listening is the, the single most valuable intervention that we have in our toolbox for this. I can't recommend it more highly. Um, and that is at, at any stage of grief and loss because it's not about fixing anything. Sometimes providers um, in, our, in our attempt to help people in supporting them, um, we're looking for a way to fix something or make somebody feel better. And that is usually a misstep when it comes to working with grief and loss because oftentimes there's nothing you can do anyway. And in the attempt of trying to fix something or to make somebody feel better, we actually um, don't express our empathy very effectively. So when we actively listen, what we're trying to do is deeply understand someone's experience. Don't be afraid to say someone's name. Don't be afraid to ask the person who's lost a loved one, um, can you tell me about them? I'd love to hear more. Get them to discuss whatever they're comfortable with. If they're not, they're not. Um, but ask open-ended questions in order to generate a deeper understanding of their experience rather than trying to get from A to Z where you're problem solving and offering solutions for things. So really genuine, authentic interactions focused on active listening and validation. Um, sometimes it's perfectly appropriate to say, I don't know what to say, but I'm really glad you're sharing this with me. And I'm, I'm happy to just sit here with you. Okay. This um, graph is something that I included because it's something that I think we all need a reminder of. Because we've all experienced grief and loss to some degree in this pandemic, it's really tempting in some circumstances to want to share our experience with the person that we're trying to support. When they say, you know, I've, I just lost so-and-so or I went through this, it is, it is a, um, a temptation, I think, in a lot of cases to say, I, you know, I get that. I identify with that. I also lost my you know, father-in-law or whomever it was. That's sort of a natural human inclination to, to want to connect with someone by also sort of co-sharing your experience. That doesn't really work in this case. What we need to make sure that we do is that the farther out you are on this circle, so whether you're part of the community or whether you're part of the close community or neighbors or family members or close friends, you want to make sure that comfort goes in and it doesn't come out. Comfort doesn't come out. You, do, you don't want to put the person who's grieving in a position to make you feel better about your particular loss when, that, when, when you're in that role. So just be really mindful about the role that you're playing and where you are in these circles in terms of the nature of the relationship. The farther out you are on the circle, the more important it is to make sure that comfort goes in unidirectionally to the person who is grieving or who has lost some, something and that you facilitate them through active listening expressing distress out from the middle. So distress comes out and comfort goes in. It's not both ways. It's not a two way street in that case. Um, and that is a challenge because like I was mentioning a second ago, most of us exp have experienced you know, either a, a secondary loss or a primary loss as a result of this pandemic. But when we are specifically trying to support someone else through that experience, we don't want that to feel like a two-way street. We don't want them to be in the position to support us. We want that to be unidirectional and send comfort to them. And then when we need our own support, whether that's professionally or personally, we go to other contacts for that, other supports to get that, to get that need met. Okay, so a little bit about active listening. I'm not sure um, how many of you do this on a regular basis and to the extent that you use it in your, in your present, professional or personal lives. Um, it's not as hard as you might think. It's just typically not something that people are used to doing. So rather than problem solving and trying to offer solutions to a particular thing, the purpose of active listening is to ask additional open-ended questions to deeply understand what someone else's experience has been. Um, it's about going, starting with the issue and going deeper rather than going through the issue to the, to the conclusion of something. Uh, if you find yourself making statements or asking closed-ended questions, those are some, some markers for you to pay attention to shifting your, um, shifting your style of interaction a little bit to make it, to bring it back more in this direction. Try and reflect back. Um, I, I, did a, I did a talk a couple months ago now, and one of the participants said, um, I, always feel like, I always feel like I'm not helping when I'm reflecting back. It feels really awkward, and I feel like I'm not helping. 
And that's a, that was a really important comment because when you're actively listening, you shouldn't be trying to help. You should be trying to understand. And there's a total difference. There's a different mindset around those two things. If, you're, if your goal in the listening is to help someone and support them, that may be the wrong goal. It's not, that's not what active listening is designed to do. The goal with active listening is designed to support. And I'm sorry, designed to understand, not support and, and fix. So it's about deeply understanding the position that the other person is in and expressing empathy to that person. If you personally are struggling, had a great, great question in the chat, thank you. How do you make the distinction between active listening and reflective listening? Um, well, they're very similar to each other and reflection is part of active listening. I kind of, I feel like it's sort of a, a ducks and birds example, like all reflective listening is part of active listening, but not the other way around. So reflective listening is reflecting back and summarizing what you think you heard. And active listening has a little bit more to it than that. So I would, I would nest reflective listening underneath active listening is how I would describe that or make that distinction. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, the, the, the last thing I'll say about this is if in your professional or personal role, you are experiencing compassion fatigue because you, you know, you're exhausted, you've been through it, you just don't have any, any emotional resource to give, this is not the thing to try, right? It, you need to have a certain amount of um, emotional capacity and energy available to you in order to engage in doing this for another person. So that's okay, there's a boundary to be had there and there's nothing wrong with healthy boundaries, right? If active listening is not something that you can effectively engage in because you need a break, then don't try and do it, that's okay. Um, on days when you have energy and when you have that emotional capacity, go ahead and try it and see how it goes. The, the other thing to keep in mind about active listening is that it absolutely does not have to happen um, in a 45 minute or 55 minute therapy session. You can do active listening in five minutes or 10 minutes because all it is is listening in a different way, right? It's not, um, it's not a whole different conversation. It's just listening in a different way. So you can do this process in five minutes or 10 minutes or, or to the extent that you have it available. But it is important also to have healthy boundaries for yourself around when you're gonna do this. Um, and then also to be able to say, um, I, hate to, I hate to interrupt you right now because I'm enjoying learning more about your experience, but I need to, I need to um, come back to this at another time. I have to go do this thing. And being willing to stop someone or interrupt them gently and very kindly and with empathy and come back to it at another time. Oftentimes, just us as humans, because our connection has been so threatened this year, when we feel like someone is really deeply trying to understand us, we want to take advantage of that opportunity and, and kind of let things go. So it is important if you do this to have some um, so to practice some boundaries and to practice some skills about um, how to uh, how to disengage from it rather than feeling like you're stuck in a particular situation. You can do both. It's just a little bit of practice. So we're going to ask you to do breakout rooms for about 10 minutes. And what I'd like you to do um, is discuss with each other things that have worked. So what are some suggestions that you have um, that you could provide to each other about specific ways to support someone who's grieving uh, grieving a loss, or who has experienced a loss. Specific words, specific questions, potentially concrete offers of ideas. I don't want to say that um, it's only active listening, right? I want I want to really strongly recommend that active listening is the first thing that you try. But sometimes, folks in a grief and loss situation are also going to want or need um, concrete suggestions and problem solving communication as well. It should be prioritized that active listening goes first and then problem solving. But oftentimes concrete suggestions for help are, are helpful to the person who's lost something. So I'd like you to share with each other some ideas. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and ask Dr. Orsay to put everybody in breakout rooms for about 10 minutes and then we'll come back together and discuss. Hello everyone. I think we're, we're coming back. Um, would anybody be willing to either add to the chat or share um, some examples of things that were discussed in the breakout room. We had some great, um, great things that came up. It was pretty, um, some challenging conversations and some challenging topics for sure. Any examples? One of the things that we discussed was when you, um, if you're working with youth or teenagers, I know there are a couple folks in the chat who indicated that they are working with uh, with teens. I, I work with teenagers in my private practice too. 
Um, one of the things that was recommended, and I don't know, I apologize, I don't um, know the name of the other participant in my um, in my breakout room, but the idea is that teenagers will only talk on their terms, right? And so part of the job of, of professionals and adults is to sort of leave that door open and to continue to leave it open. And they, they do tend to communicate and participate in things really when they want to at the oddest hours and at the oddest times, but just when it's convenient for them. And so making sure that we do our best at least to leave those opportunities available to them and to continue to reach out and to continue to check in and ask because at some point they will walk through that door. They almost always do. Um, and so when, when teenagers are, and when we know that teenagers are an age group that is exceptionally um, struggling, they're in crisis right now, they're having quite a bit of behavioral health emergency. Um, and I don't think Washington state is alone on that. I think that's the case all over um, that having some, um, you know, continual and regular check-ins with folks is a really helpful thing. There's a reason why teenagers talk in the car. Um, and there's something to be said for physically being in an alignment with someone, not sitting across from the table, grilling them, right? Sitting down next to them and, and so that they don't feel like they're on the spot. Um, it's a captive audience in the car too. That's another thing. Um, but do, teenagers and adolescents tend to disclose and to open up more when they're, when they're feeling like they're subconsciously aligned with you. And so if you can, if you can arrange your physical space, if you're seeing people in person, and sit on the same side of the table or on the same, um, on the, in the same direction and face outward towards a problem in front of you both, um, that, that's a good sort of subconscious messaging aspect to take. Um, yeah, FaceTime is good too. They can, they can control that a little bit more. There's a great recommendation here about um, it's okay to take whatever time they need. And if it interrupts your day, it interrupts your day. Grief and loss express themselves whenever they, whenever it wants to. It's not something that is, a convenience issue. It's gonna happen and it's part of the process. If you work with young kids, if any of you work with uh, in a pediatric kind of a setting, it's important to also recognize that kids process grief and loss in a very different way. And you might give them bad news and then they'll say, okay, can I go play now? And then they'll, they'll come back to it uh, you know, in a day or so and it'll, it'll be a, a longer and sort of a up and down processing for kids, which is very normal. Another recommendation I wanna make generally before I jump back into the slides is that it's really important to give children of all ages developmentally appropriate information about loss and death. We um, tend to be sort of culturally uncomfortable talking about death and loss and we need to work on being more um, directly com communicative about those issues and to not hide things from kids and to not, not reframe it like, um, auntie went on a vacation or so-and-so took a long nap and they aren't waking up. If kids don't have accurate information, what ends up happening usually is that they make up something uh, in their creative minds that's typically worse than what actually happened. And they tend to internalize it. They, they, they tend to think, well, did I do something to make auntie go away on the vacation? Or maybe I said something or I did something or, or what have you. So giving them developmentally appropriate and correct and accurate information using the term that so-and-so died, um, so-and-so passed away, whatever the language is that's culturally appropriate for them, but to be, to be honest and to be straightforward. There are also lots of great resources for kids. There's a book called The Invisible String, which I would highly recommend. Um, it's a good way for, for kids and adolescents to process um, all variety of losses, but that one is specifically about people in their lives. So, just some examples, um, evening sessions, weekends, yeah, flexibility. As long as you can protect yourself too, in terms of having boundaries around your availability, that's really important. Um, but I love those suggestions, Dr. Joy, thank you. Um, anything else that came up in your, in your breakout rooms? Okay, I'm just gonna put a few more slides up for you all. Um, So content considerations. I talked a lot about um, uh, active listening and how important that is as a process to use. For content, what we really wanna be mindful of as providers is to facilitate um, people not making impulsive decisions when they've been confronted with a loss. If the loss is unexpected, um, oftentimes our brains can have a knee-jerk kind of reaction where we might do something else that's either risky or um, very impulsive related to money, 
or moving or some big sort of life decision. And we really want to try and um, try and rein people in a little bit. If they're in the grief and loss process to, to slow down, to take a little bit of time and not to make um, big impulsive decisions along the way. Uh, that, that often is a challenge for people. And it's something that we need to be aware of as providers. Um, you know, with COVID, one of the biggest challenges is modifying the way that we grieve, um, modifying how we're able to get together and honor things and uh, communicate with each other, help identify relationships of support that are available and creative ways that the person who's lost something can be connected. Um, and then psychoeducation too, providing information about what's going on with the brain, um, why we react the way that we do and um, all, of, all of those normal things. Okay, youth activities, right? Yeah, we talked about this um, when I did this yesterday, rituals or routines. That's part of what this model is gonna summarize for you. So the last thing we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna share with you this acronym model called HEAL that sort of summarizes some of these takeaway points. I agree with those great suggestions in the chat too, thank you. So the HEAL model starting points. There's no right or wrong way to process grief and loss, which I've said before. There's no specific time frame. It's gonna look different for everybody and that's okay. It is about us learning how to be comfortable with it um, and letting other people feel whatever it is that they feel. The elements of this model are interchangeable. It's not a particular order. The reason why I use an acronym is because it's easier for me to remember that way. So it's totally okay to be flexible back and forth with how these things go. The H in HEAL stands for honor. That is the ritual, that is the ceremony that is participating in events, doing it online, um, you know, it's different when it's on Zoom or whatever format, but it's still, um, it still is effective in some ways and it can still help people process through the experience. So finding ways to participate rather than avoiding, honoring the loss, honoring the situation, writing it down, doing some journaling, writing a letter, um, reflecting on, on memories, looking at pictures, all of those kinds of things. So that's the first aspect of the model is to honor the loss. The next one in the model is to express emotion. And I mentioned this at the beginning, um, there aren't any wrong emotions and being angry, especially in the context of COVID is a very, very common emotional experience that people ex have when they've lost something. Um, there is a lot of fear and a lot of sadness that is covered up through anger because like I mentioned before, it's easier to be angry than to feel those, those more challenging emotions for a lot of people. That's not the case all the time, um, but it's often the case. Uh, it's, it is also common for people to have anger towards the person who has died and then feel guilty about that and not know how to, how to navigate those two things and feeling like there's something wrong with them for being angry at the person um, or angry, so angry at the circumstances that they can't, they can't move forward because they're so angry about how it happened or that they weren't able to say goodbye in person um, and they can't set that down and go. That's related to the next part of the model that I'll that I'll explain in a second, but the bottom line here is that the expression of any emotions at any point in the bereavement process uh, is something that we can and should have the opportunity to facilitate as providers. The, the most tricky one, I think, in this model is the acknowledgement of the loss. And the biggest key here is to recognize certain statements. It is very, very common for people to say, but if, or if only, Right, so if, it, but if I had done this, but if they had said this, but if it hadn't been COVID, if only uh, we were closer together, then I would have seen this coming. Whatever it is, right? The, the if onlys and the but ifs are obstacles that get in the way of people moving through the loss. And, and I'm not suggesting anybody gets pushed. I'm not suggesting that we sort of, you know, push people through this process at all, not by any means but it's really, really helpful from a provider perspective to, to recognize when this is happening and where, where someone is stuck. Um, it's the obstacles that commonly get in the way. And again, not, um, not in the way of acceptance necessarily, but a, a way of processing through the experience, sort of the reality of what has been lost and the, um, the coming to terms process. So the acknowledgement is a really, really key feature of that. And the ones that I have listed here are the most common. So avoiding it or denying it, that's not happening. Um, there was a woman that I worked with, um, with Hurricane Katrina, who wouldn't leave her porch. She sat on her porch for days and FEMA said the house was uninhabitable and she had to leave and she wouldn't leave. 
this is my home. I'm not leaving. It's not, you know, it's just not happening. And that's the, that's the avoiding or denying it because she couldn't contemplate where else she was going to go. Um, wishing things were different uh, than they are. And then wondering what could have caused a different outcome. Okay. Uh, the last bit of this model is about living. And this is not meant to be as cliche as it sort of sounds, but um, at first when people experience a very deep or profound loss, it is just about existing. It is about breathing. It is about getting up the next day. And it's just, and there's not, there's not a lot of color in life. Um, where we want to try and encourage people to go and to, to eventually become is active participant in their own life, learning, contributing, um, connecting to other people again. This is really emotionally challenging for people who are in complex grief and bereavement. Um, sometimes all they can do for quite some time, and again, no time limits, no sense of pushing or rushing this, but sometimes all someone can do is just get through the day and in, in a survival mode. And, and that's fine and that's part of the process too. But what we want to try and um, psychologically support is active living, not just surviving. And again, the time phases, sometimes this can take a few days to a few weeks, sometimes this can take years. And there's a whole range of experiences in between there. The active development of resilience is really gonna help with that. And the, the elements of resilience are purpose. So finding another purpose in life or an additional purpose Re reconnecting to your purpose and your motivation, um, having connection to other people, having relationships of any kind, uh, being flexible or adaptive and having hope. Those are the four pieces of resilience. So um, where, this, where this boils down in terms, of, um, in terms of bereavement and grief and loss is when people really struggle with purpose. They think, you know, I thought I knew what, what I was going to expect in life. And then now this person is gone or I've lost my job or whatever the loss is. And now I no longer have a, a clear sense of purpose. I worked with a grandfather in Haiti after the earthquake and his wife had been killed. His, his adult children had been killed and he had lost his home and his business. Everything was destroyed by this earthquake. The only thing he had left were his two granddaughters. They were the only surviving members of his family. And he did not have much of a purpose. He did not have much of a reason for living according to his own statement. And he did some trainings and he did some sessions and some support. And he came up to me at the end of one of these. And he said, I think I figured out what I need my new purpose to be. I, need, I figured out what's gonna help motivate me to live. And that is that I can speak English and I can teach my granddaughters how to speak English too. And that will get me out of bed in the morning. That is a skill that I have that I can teach someone else. Um, and that's, that's what it was. That's a, that's a fairly extreme example under very incredibly challenging circumstances, but he was able to identify a motivator for him to encourage him to live. Um, and you know, not everybody is going to be even able to look at that, at least initially different people, depending on where they are in the process might not be able to do that, but that is a concrete example for you of of active living and reorienting around purpose, which is part of resilience. These last two slides are resources for you. Our team has written many, many guidance documents and produced a lot of stuff to help people with the behavioral health aspects of the pandemic. There is a lot more about grief and loss that other members of our team have created that are, that are on this, uh, this webpage right here, the Behavioral Health Resources webpage for Washington State Department of Health. Um, we have a grief and loss guidance document for providers specifically, and we have a tip sheet for, for the public about grief and loss issues associated with COVID. So I would definitely uh, recommend that you check those out if this topic is something that you'd like to learn, learn even more about. And I have a few more minutes, I think, so I will be happy to take a question or two if there are any. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Masseth. Um, I'm just scanning through the chat to see if there's more questions. There's some suggestions, um, rituals, routines to commemorate, um, writing in journals. There's a youth journal called Duct Tape that is apparently um, a good resource. And people are uh, giving you kudos. Uh, I'm not seeing a, a, a question, but um, I think we'll just give people a moment or two to um, think about what questions they may have at this point for you. I'm just going to take a moment as well to remind folks that our evaluation survey 
is not only required of us by SAMHSA, our, the source of our funding, but also helps us improve and offer you the kinds of trainings that are valuable to you. You can connect with us in various ways, our newsletter, our social media presence, and our website. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We appreciate your time. And thank you to our presenter for her time today